The year is 1996. I'm 12 years old. I'm an intermediate student at Clark Intermediate School. Before these basketball games would start that I was a part of, I was a starting point guard. I would sit down in the seats. And as I was sitting down in the seat, I would look towards the end of the gym. I look towards the end of the gym and I'm waiting for my dad to walk through the doors. Before every single game, I would sit in these seats and I would say the same thing. Come on, dad. Come on, dad. You promised me. You told me you were gonna take off of work and you were gonna come and watch me hoop today. And every game I would sit and I would have this conversation with myself. I would watch Jeff's mom come through the doors. I would watch Richie's parents, mom and dad show up. I would watch Brent's dad make it. I would watch Jason's mom make it and sometimes Jason's mom and dad. But what I didn't get to see was my dad walk through those doors. I didn't get to see my dad walk through those doors to watch me compete playing basketball, which was my first dream. I wanted to go to the NBA. I was a short white kid from the middle of California that was talking about going to the University of Michigan. Then I was going to go off and play in the NBA, but I needed my hero to show up for me. And what I didn't realize at 12 years old was I was about to make a decision about who I was and what I was capable of doing in the world in that moment. At 12 years old, I was about to create a limiting belief system about emotional experience I was having with my father. See, my father's time and my father's affection meant more than anything to me in the world, but I didn't know that at 12 years old. What I knew was I wanted my dad to come and watch me hoop. And if my dad didn't come watch me hoop, but everybody else's parents were coming to watch them play basketball, I thought to myself, my dad doesn't love me. If my dad loved me, he would have came and watched me play basketball. If I was good enough, my dad would have came and watched me play basketball. This self-limiting belief system became a instinctual thought process in everything that I did from 12 years old until the reformation of my life started at 23 years old. See, I made a conversation with myself and the outcome was I can't, I won't, and I'll never be able. At this time at 12 years old, I was starting to wonder what it would be like to kill myself because I could take away these emotional disturbances that started occurring. And it wasn't something I could control. It wasn't something I understood. I just knew when I came to school, I had social anxiety. I was struggling with depression and I was isolating away from individuals because I never felt like I really fit in. And then I had this experience with my father that helped create this limiting belief system that I had about myself and in the world. And at this time in the mid nineties, we didn't talk about mental health. We didn't talk about anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts. We didn't talk about having conversations with individuals like Families First. We didn't have many resources like Families First. They came into the schools and talked to individuals and promoted the resources that they had that were available to not only students, but families. Because when I was 12 years old, I sat down with my mom and I told my mom, something is wrong with me. I wanna kill myself. I need you to help me. And my mom just looked at me with a blank stare. And I remember looking at her like, what, does she not hear me? Does she not understand me? And so I turned and I ran and literally ran and jumped into a wall. And my mom just looked at me. And I know it's not my mom, my mom not caring. My mom didn't know what to do. My mom didn't have uh, a family's first organization that was working in the school that she could call and say, something is happening with my son. He's struggling with his mental health. He's struggling with his identity and trying to figure out his place in the world. And he wants to kill himself as a result. I didn't have that. The only thing I had was a conversation right here. All across the country, kids are having conversations right here. And they're deciding who they are and what their value is in the world, just like I did at 12 years old. Luckily for myself, though, I was a naturally gifted athlete. It didn't matter what the sport was. My, my dream was to go to the NBA, but I could play basketball, baseball, soccer, rollerblade, skateboards, BMX bikes, volleyball, tennis, whatever sport that it was, I was always the best at doing it because I was always the best at doing it. I got a lot of attention, but I didn't like that attention because of my social anxiety. But the one thing that sports gave me was an outlet to help release a lot of the emotional pressure that I was experiencing. That outlet was one way to kind of curve my mental health struggles. What I didn't have was family first. See, at 12 years old, when I made that decision about who I was going to be and what I was worth in the world, I had to find something to cope with how I was experiencing these emotional disturbances. The first coping mechanism I developed was acting up in the classroom, but that didn't work. I got kicked out of seventh grade. 
And when I got kicked out of seventh grade as a result of my behavior, I was uh, put in homeschool. And then when I came back to school, I was already back. I was already on a BMX bicycle. This would be the sport that I would uh, compete with for the rest of my years of uh, competing in sports. Uh, I, at the time I was 18 years old, I was on the cover of the largest BMX racing magazine in the world. I was sponsored by Fox Racing, Airwalk Shoes, Spy Sunglasses. Companies that didn't sponsor amateur athletes were endorsing me because they knew that when I turned pro, I would be uh, one of the top pros in the world for the sport of BMX racing. And kids and people in the community would have saw me and they knew who I was and all the things that I was accomplishing BMX would have said, don't worry about that guy. He's going to go off and race BMX and be super successful. But they didn't know that I didn't have coping skills for the emotional stuff that I was experiencing. They didn't know that I created a self-limiting belief system at 12 years old that told myself I can't, I won't, and I'll never be able. And that despite being on the cover of the largest magazine in the world for BMX racing, I still wanted to kill myself. I still had anxiety. I still had depression. I was still completely disconnected from society up here. And as a result of this emotional pressure, as a result of this unchecked mental health that I had, I began to search for coping mechanisms on a deeper level. I still had my bike that helped me, but when I, get, when I stepped off of my bike at 18 years old to take a computer job down in San Diego, uh, San Diego, California, as a network administrator for a guy that was starting a wireless internet company, I no longer had the emotional release that I was getting from competing in sports. I didn't have a safe place to have a conversation. I didn't have coping skills that I could have learned from a place like Families First. I had a conversation just here. So I started going to parties, just like everybody else does when they're 16, 17, 18 and above. And I saw people smoking weed and drinking, smoking weed and drinking. And I thought to myself, while well, my friends are doing it, maybe I'll give it a try. So I started trying smoking weed and I thought to myself, this is kind of cool, but I don't really like it. And I don't want to smoke weed every single day like my friends do. So I told myself, maybe I'll just do it once a month. Unfortunately for myself, I wasn't able to just do it once a month. And I started smoking weed every single day, just like my friends do. But it wasn't the coping mechanism that helped my anxiety, my depression, and my suicidal thoughts. That was Oxycontin. I was introduced to Oxycontin at 18 years old. And when I took Oxycontin, with the snap of a finger, it took away my anxiety, my depression, and my suicidal thoughts. And I thought to myself, I'm fixed. Why can't the doctors just give me this? Why can't they prescribe me this? Because as soon as I take Oxycontin, I'm fixed. See, what I didn't understand and what I learned in 2017 as a keynote speaker for a national conference on addiction disorders, stuff like 68% of kids who drink, smoke, or use mind-altering substances before the age of 14 have been sexually abused. 68 percent. When I was a kid, I was told to stay away from kids that were 12, 13, 14, that were using drugs and drinking because they were bad kids. Now that I know what I know and what I've learned through my work over the last 11 years, working in communities and with governments and schools and high schools and colleges across the country, these aren't bad kids. These are kids who have experiences some of them more traumatic than others. And they are lacking the tools that they need to cope with this, this experience and create a self-empowering belief system. See, you can be sexually abused and still believe that you have value in the world, that you're still created to do something special and that you're still a lovable person. But oftentimes it takes help. I've been in therapy for uh, 10 years now. I'm 37 years old. I need a therapist a conversation, a safe place to have a conversation and somebody that can help me frame experiences that I'm having because what I did at 12 years old is still an instinctual behavior that I have to overcome at 37 years old. I didn't understand that when I took Oxycontin and it made me feel fixed, it was helping me escape from a moment that when I was 12 years old, the Oxycontin addiction would take control of my life. At 21 years old, I committed a home invasion robbery armed with a weapon. By 23 years old, I was homeless on the street. I was homeless on the street, and at 23 years old, I was arrested for the robbery that I committed, and I was sentenced to four and a half years in prison. 
when I got to prison, I remember I sat down on my prison bunk, cell 254 on the top bunk at Wasco State Prison. I looked up into the ceiling and I read this quote. It said, be careful what you think because your thoughts become your words. Be careful what you say because your words become your actions. Careful what you do because your actions become your habits. Be careful what you make a habit because your habits become your character and your character becomes your destiny. And I remember I kept reading it over and over and over and it started making so much sense to me. I'm 23 years old and for the first time in my life, I'm looking at something like this quote and I'm seeing the mechanics behind how we end up in places that we end up. And I started thinking to myself, if this is the quote that is the blueprint that has taken me to a prison cell, then this is gonna be the quote that helps me re-engineer my life and I'm gonna become successful. In that eight by 12 prison cell, I set four goals. I said, when I get out of here, I'm gonna race BMX professionally. I'm going back to my bike. I stopped at 18, was homeless by 23. I gave up on my gift. I'm going back to it. And not only am I going back to my gift, I'm gonna to go to the Olympics. When I get out of here, I'm gonna start a nonprofit organization called the Free World Project that uses action sports to work with at-risk kids in Southeast Fresno. And when I get out of here, I'm gonna become a, a professional speaker. But I don't know how I'm gonna go from a prison cell to the Olympics. Because at this time, there'd never been a human being that started in a prison cell and made it to the Olympics. But I read in this really big book, if you could be trusted with little, you'll be trusted with much. And I thought to myself, what does that mean? For me, that meant I didn't know how to brush my teeth every single day at 23 years old. And that if I couldn't brush my teeth or be trusted with brushing my teeth, there was no way that I was gonna be trusted with something like the Olympics. So I learned how to brush my teeth. Then I learned how to make my bed. Then I learned how to organize my stuff. After I learned how to organize my stuff, I learned how to work hard training every single day for the Olympics, even though I was gonna be incarcerated for two whole years before I got out to even get back on my bicycle. And then I started asking myself some really important questions like, why do I feel this way? And why do I respond to things that happen to me emotionally the way I do? And I had mentors that came in my life, like Toby Wade, that helped direct me in understanding myself, understanding my behavior, encouraging me in the gifts that I had and how I could utilize those to help people in the world. When I got out of prison two years later, I was a completely different person. Such a different person that oftentimes now that my story has gone viral around the world, that places like the California, uh, California Department of Corrections will hoist my story up and they'll say, be like Tony, be like Tony. And I have to tell them, I am not the rule. I'm an exception to the rule. Many individuals do not grow up in a neighborhood that's not filled with gangs, it's not filled with violence, it's not filled with drugs. And a lot of individuals do not grow, in a home, grow up in a home where their parents have been married for 47 years. They just don't. I was lucky enough to graduate from one of the top public schools in the United States and my parents have been married for 47 years. I had a lot of foundational things that helped structure my life and my reformation. Which means without it, it would have been much more of a struggle which means organizations like Family First are that much more critical to the communities that we have. Because without them, individuals are left with this. And if we just decide that individuals should be self-starters and learn how to completely reform their lives from the trauma that they've experienced, the neighborhoods that they've grown up in, then we're not doing ourselves justice to the community. I got out of prison. I started racing BMX professionally five months later after I got out. I won five races at the lower pro division that first year. I moved up to the Olympic level one year after being back on my bicycle. I made six finals at the Olympic level before I blew my knee out in 2011. When I blew my knee out in 2011, I had to ask myself, why did this happen? Six months later, I started my nonprofit organization and I started coaching BMX athletes. I started speaking about a year after I got back on my bicycle. So I had all these things that I was working on that I said that I was going to do when I was in prison. By the time 2016 came around, my nonprofit organization was raising over $120,000, giving away $40,000 worth of bicycles, $10,000 worth of skateboards. My public speaking had gone from just being a local kid that was talking to schools to being one of the most sought after substance abuse speakers in the country. My BMX coaching had went from nobody wanted me to coach them in 2012 
to having two world champions, three national champions, 25 athletes from Australia to Bolivia by 2016. And 2016 in July, Brooke Crane called me and said, pack your bags, Hoff, we're going to the Olympics. I didn't make it to the Olympic games as an athlete like I wanted. I made it to the Olympic games as a coach like I was supposed to be. In 2019, my story went viral with Goldcast. It's been viewed over 11 million times. In 2019, I became one of the biggest speakers in all of the markets in the United States. And I stand before you today to tell you this. Organizations like Family First are federally and state funded. And as a nonprofit executive director, I understand how federal funds and state funds work oftentimes. They don't allow us to have the creativity. They don't allow us to always branch out and focus on new ways that we can impact the community. And that's why we're here today. We're here today to say that your help can not only help the community, but it can help families first create new vision, create new structure, and create new ideas to work with kids, to work with families. Because people ask me, is there something that could have stopped you from going down the path that you went down? And it's simple. I needed a mentor. I needed families first. I needed somebody that understood what I was experiencing with my mental health, with my struggles with my dad. They could sit down with me and help me change the story from I can't, I won't, and I'll never be able to I can, I am, I, and I will be able. Thank you. Awesome job. Thanks. I have to stop. Is that all right? 